Okay, hello. Hi, everybody. This is Al, obviously, from the Kelly Writers House in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania, and we have friends who've joined us here. Uh, Chris Martin, uh, I'm going to reintroduce you in a second, but maybe you can turn the camera toward our friends, Christine, Valerie, Andrea, and Colette, who've joined us, Modpo people. Chris Martin, how are you doing? Doing great. Okay, you want to turn the camera? Uh, I want to be the best angle. You don't want to do that? Why don't you show them? Show the. You're just not. You're just not. No, I'm not of you. Yes, Christine, say hello, Christine, Valerie, Andrea, and Colette, and of course there's Jason, who's become our master of uh, the portable mic. And um, at the phone we have Lily Applebaum, as usual, and Steve McLaughlin, whose middle a name, middle initials are D A, and that's not like district attorney or anything. It is digital audio. Chris, Steve McLaughlin, and Chris Martin, who's behind the camera, who refuses to show himself. And then up here we have, to my far right, of course, we have Max, we have Dave, we have Amaris of the booming voice, we have Kristen Martin, yes, and we have Anna, who's caught up on her sleep, and yours truly. Listen, we're going to go an hour and five minutes today, so I really wanted to do the intros fast. Uh, our next week we'll be back at 10 p.m. Eastern Time and we'll have a longer session. We'll do an hour and a half again, which the Modpo people love because at 11.30 uh, Eastern Time, they're just getting started. <laughs> it's as if it's really 4.30 Eastern Time, p.m. Anyway, um, a couple of preliminaries. Um, we have a Modpo person with a birthday. And then I did the math and realized that um, if there are 33,000 people in Modpo, the chances are there are a number of birthdays every day. Just yeah. do your math. I mean, I don't do much math, but I did enough to know. But we do know of we do know of Ashley Biviano's birthday. Happy birthday, Ashley. I know you said you were going to tune in, so happy birthday wherever you are. And I think that we should sing happy birthday to you. This has probably never been done in the in the Coursera format. So <laughs> Anna doesn't want to sing. She's in a protest right. mode right. right now. Okay. So but I realized that if we sing happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, dear Ashley, we're doing that we're committing the imitative fallacy, or not we're not actually. We're not doing the Modpo thing of just saying something totally cliche. I mean, it's like giving her a dozen roses. So I think what we should do is take a cue from the Baroness. What does the Baroness say about Valentine's Day, Amaris? I don't know. What does she say about Come closer to the mic. What does she say about Valentine's Day? Kristen? I'm not sure. Say it with bolts. She says, <laughs> say it with bolts. You don't know your Baroness. You skipped the Baroness, I can tell. <laughs> uh, say it with bolts. Don't say it with flowers, which was the, it's, even back then was the pre-FTD, you know, cliche. Say it with bolts. So, Ashley, we're going to sing Happy Bolts Day to you. Happy <laughs> Bolts Day to you. Happy <laughs> Bolts Day to you. Dear Ashley, etc. And um, I like that. It sounds like Bolts Day sounds like kind of a lost German tribe language, you know. <laughs> Today is my Bolts Day. Okay, it just sounds right, doesn't it? Okay, here we go. I'm going to start us off for Ashley. Ashley, we love you, whoever you are. Here we go. Happy Bolts Day to you. Louder! Happy Bolts Day to you. Portable mic! Happy Bolts Day, dear Ashley. Happy Bolts Day to you. I'm embarrassed. Happy Bolts Day, uh, Ashley. That was really great. Now, um, if Ashley's having a good day, we wanted to shout out to Cassandra Hatfield of Ohio who had a bad day yesterday. Um, I don't really want, know what to say, Cassandra, to console you, but um, we are your Mod Po pals, and um, we hope you have a better day today. Um, her, uh, her dog killed her cat, and the dog has been very aggressive and is protective of her new baby. And it looks like she's got to lose the dog as well. So, she, and I'm not saying anything out of school. She wrote that to Facebook. But uh, anyway, Cassandra, um, I hope everything goes well for you. And um, one of the things that got said uh, in response to Cassandra, uh, aside from hugs from Louisa Lai, was Sophia Polis, who's pretty active in the Facebook group, says um, the best thing to do when you're having a bad day is get lost in the poetry. So may you get lost in the poetry, Cassandra. And let's get started now with questions. It looks like um, Julia is in Los Angeles, California, in or vicinity. Julia, where exactly are you? Good morning. I'm in East Hollywood today. You're in East Hollywood? I'm in East Hollywood. I mean, I'm sorry to say something nasty about a place in the world, but East Hollywood? <laughs> East Hollywood. East Hollywood is the residential 
it's it's the part of Hollywood that's like a hybrid between residential neighborhoods and in uh, movie studios. It's a very cool neighborhood. Okay, I apologize. I'm used to West Hollywood, which is kind of schlocky. Sorry about that, East Hollywood. That's okay. anyway, why are you in East Hollywood? Because it's the best part of Los Angeles. Oh, you get, okay. You know, you get the best tacos. You get you get some celebrity star power. Uh, you know, what else could you want? Great hey, farmers. Yeah, would you? Do you think you would um, one night just open up your place for as a salon for for uh, Modpo people? I, you know, I didn't even. Never mind. Don't answer that question. <laughs> well, listen, fun. I do. I do want to say that a lot, a bunch of Los Angeles Modpo people met at uh, LACMA last weekend, and I, I had to miss it, but um, but I'm hoping that we can do it again, and that I can meet up with those folks. Cool. Yeah, that's. I saw that photo, and I think that's great. I think the photo was on Facebook. Okay, so Julie is there. You're so you're watching the the discussion forum, and in the discussion forum, we've got a sub forum. So you go to the main forum page, which has the link that says uh, something like "discussion of webcasts," and then you click on that, and you'll see the current webcast, and that's where you go ahead. Yes. Yes. And that's where Julia is watching for questions and comments. She's also watching our Twitter feed. The Twitter feed is at ModPoPen, M-O-D-P-O-P-E-N-N. And if you are savvy enough to use hashtags, it's ModPoLive or ModPolov or ModPolov with a hashtag in front of it. And we have our phone, which is 215-573-9752, 215-573-9752. And Lily has a call from whom, Lily? Al, I have Isabel from Massachusetts. Is this Isabel with the like Dutch last name Von de Vandenhoven or something like that? I didn't ask, but when we patch her through, she okay. might be able to tell you. She All has right. a question about chance operation. Oh no, we're getting already to chance operations. Okay, let's, okay? oh I guess Kristen Zara kind of raised the issue. Okay, let's hear it. Okay. Um, switch in Isabel. Steve McLaughlin is supervising, and here it goes. Isabel. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. You have a long sort of Dutch-like last name, is that correct? Yes, Vandenhoeven. Vandenhoeven. Was I right? I said yeah. Vandenhoeven. Ooh, you know, like I'm this is like. I'm surprised that you guys can remember any names. I can't remember more than a few names, but you're one of them that I remember. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, you have a question about chance operations. This is really going to be cool because one of the things that your question is bound to do is is elicit some comments from us about Chapter Nine specifically chapter 9.2 and this is Al cheerleading to Modpo people to stay with us through chapter 9. Okay Isabel let's hear let's hear I know well, you I will. Had, let's I hear your question. I have a negative question about chance operation so this may not do the trick. All right. Um, I'm just thinking that poetry generally is about personal experience rather than you know I, to me chance operations is like a psychology test or a political statement and if there's nothing of the give and take of I had this experience or this feeling is there any hope for chance operations to do that later on because I just don't get it Wow huge question and I think what I'm gonna do is say a word and I'm gonna invite a couple of my colleagues here to say a word this is a huge question very important question uh, we can't linger on it too long now but it is introduced at the end of chapter 2 so here goes all right okay. the, the a common understanding is that that the poetry that is most personal is thus the most powerful and the truest and that what the eye of the speaker should do is speak personally okay? mm -hmm. that's the assumption and that when you get away from that by by doing what Ray Armentrout did in the way which is to say find I elsewhere in the world only to come back to I at the end that the, the 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 sort of common approach, the common sense approach to that is that it's less personal, less moving, and you know less about subjectivity and us and our exper personal experiences. Um, but we have to have an open mind about how, first of all, the self is multiple, right? So that you never quite know which I is speaking, the I okay. of which self. Mm -hmm. Certainly, Emily Dickinson had about a thousand selves, <laughs> or maybe you would say, you know, she had. 1700 cells which is the number of poems that she wrote and probably more because some of her poems have several selves in them 
you can also say, as our chapter 9 poets will say, is that the self is wandering, it's nomadic, and that the biological, standard biological definition of the self is that it ends at the end of the body, and then there's a space between one subject and another subject, another person, and that that space is a kind of black hole space where no self ha selfhood happens, and then when you enter the body or brain of the next person, you reach another self, and that one self can only speak of the one self and cannot... And, and even Robert Frost in Mending Wall is interested in figuring out what's in the space between the two selves. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. um, this is clearly, you know, potentially just postmodern bullshit, um, <laughs> right? But when you get to someone like Jackson McClough, he's going to use chance operations to be able to say, he actually does chance operations on Gertrude Stein's Stein oh as, a, as, as a source text, which He's makes way down the rabbit hole. Yeah, it's down the rabbit hole. It's like a, it's like Stein squared. But what Jackson was able to do was to read his poems, which sound ever so much personal and beautiful, and be able to say, "You're going to hear Dave Poplar, you know, wax so poetic. He's almost in tears about that." Um, I think he, I think he did that uh, in the introductory video as well to say that counterintuitively, when you do that and the poem is very moving and personal, you think it's even more powerful that cliches were not used and that like feelings <laughs> were not expressed. So this is like a really vague uh, kind of general Mod Poe-ish answer to that, hoping you'll get to chapter 9, but I would, I'd like to invite a couple of my colleagues to just weigh in briefly on this as a way of anticipating this discussion as it goes forward. And by the way, it's the quiz question on Kristen Zara really gets at this. He says that it's original, that what you're doing is unique and original. And in fact, that's not, because you're taking words from the newspaper. What's original is the process by which the words came to be. So I'll invite anybody just to say a word or two. I know all of you think about this. Anna, a word or two about this. Well, I think no matter what you do, no matter what process you use or kind of underlying concept you use, I mean, that's a little more chapter 90 mm -hmm. to use the word concept, but I think that no matter no matter what your process is, the the poetic you know author I guess is going to come through, and sometimes through the process. Yeah. So for Jackson McClough, the process is very personal. Yeah. Kristen, a word on this? I actually think that I find some of these chants or conceptual poems more personal than the typical personal poem because I get to participate in them and find the thread of the author in them myself. And I feel like I have more of a connection to that work. So when Tristan Zara says the poem will be like you, I actually do believe that because you can kind of find the authorial thread or what, what a hint of what that personal aspect of the poem might be as you read it. This is the most counterintuitive topic in Modpo, no doubt about that. Amaris, a word on this? Um, I think that in the composition of it, when the source text is found material, the selection of it already is personal in itself, and it, you don't need that sort of sentimental lyricism that can feel so bland and cliche. Sentimental lyricism. If I go out into a field and say, I miss my lover, you know, how many times have you heard that? Do you really believe I'm saying something personal? I'm actually saying something more literary historical. But if I find a way to, sit, to prove to you that I didn't create those words, that I put them together, and I come up with the sentiment of sadness and, and bereftness, if that's a word, you'll probably be more moved by the fact that it happened. Um, uh, Dave, Max, any thought on this real quick? I think it just makes us realize that everything is a choice. Even when we pick, like the Tristan Zara poem, pick random selections from a newspaper, just the, select, the act of selection is a choice and makes it unique and makes it something completely original. Max? I'm going to recommend that, uh, Isabel, that you hang on until we get to uh, John Cage's uh, misostic experiments later in the course, and you'll get the chance to try them out for yourself, um, and you'll see that some of the results from these chance operations can be remarkable, astonishing, personal, and breathtaking. It's, it's, it's powerful. Isabel, how are you doing with all this? Uh, wow. <laughs> it is counterintuitive. Yeah, I know. I mean, you were warning us about Stein, but to me, that's the hard this is going to be the hardest part. Right. Well, I'm amazed, frankly, that um, Modpo people have taken to Stein. It may be that I set expectations really low, or rather, I created a kind, I did a little cheerleading of how hard it was going to be, and I think my favorite thing in all of Modpo so far is a thread that says, um, uh, a, uh, a long dress is perfect, makes perfect sense. 
That's the thread. It makes perfect sense. And oh my, I mean, I feel like teaching works because we all go into Stein thinking it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. What Stein is in a sense saying is maybe we should stop making sense and try to make sense in a different way. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's a, that's what poetry ought to do. Poetry needs to shift our attention, and, and poetry needs to violate our expectations as readers and interpreters. I think that the stupid that stupid trick poem by John Peel Bishop does exactly that. It mocks us for being so conventional in the way we read, left to right, if we're unless we're reading Hebrew or top top down Chinese or something, left to right, and um and and then down, but. What if we started to look at letters as letters and words as words? And then he, when we do that in that poem, he mocks us for having fallen into the trick of reading a cliché sonnet. And right. in a way, that's what everything in Mod Poe after chapter 7 does. It's, it, it sort of ta taunts us. It, not taunts us in a negative way. It, it lures us into the situation that Cassandra Hatfield needs to be in after she had a bad day, which is not to escape into poetry, but to find the poetry shifts your attention away from, well, that bad day. It makes you look at things differently. It makes you realize that there's another dog out there that could be yours, or whatever. But talk about sentimental cliches. Um, anyway, so Isabel, you're in Boston? Uh, in Hudson, yes, Massachusetts. Great. And are there any Modpo people in the area? Have you gotten together with them? Um, I honestly don't know. I have not gotten together with anyone. Okay. Well, do you feel connected to, to, to some Modpo people anyway? Well, it's the forums. In, originally, I had no plans to get on the forums. I was terrified of that, and I find it very, very fun. <laughs> it's just well, your, your contributions are great, and thank you so much for calling, and have a great day. Thanks. Isabel is the one who suggested uh, the Modpo movie. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Her for that. Who's, Isabel, what, we who's, play, that. who's playing Max, Isabel? I think I we think may have she, lost her. She hung up. Her. Ryan Gosling, Ryan apparently. Ryan Gosling. <laughs> so you would have to remove. And Alice that. Mandy Patinkin. Mandy Patinkin, what do I have to sing? <laughs> That's perfect. I, I, I have to sing? I mean, I performed the Baroness. What more could I want? Okay. Hello, Julia. How are you in East Hollywood? I'm doing wonderful. Uh, Good. I have a question about Stein. Okay. This is from David on the discussion forum. And, David? Um, is it David? David. Yep. He says, I'm beginning to understand what some of you are saying about Stein's work. So I think David is, you know, in the camp of the skeptics. Um, he says, but one thing is, still... Is comes David Blaine? Yes. Uh, He's a skeptic. Yes. But we love him. He's a really nice skeptic. <laughs> yes. Um, he says, one thing still troubles me. If there are no objective benchmarks we can measure her work against, how can it be judged? If I were to find an unpublished Stein poem and at the same time I presented it to you, I showed you another unpublished work in a similar vein produced by a 12-year-old, how could you tell the difference? Okay, I'm going to give it to the TAs uh, <laughs> to answer, um, but I will say as a preface that David is participating in a long humbug tradition of <laughs> anti-modernism. Um, it's always been the case that um, the, uh, the, the Cubist collage paintings in particular, where newspaper articles and other things are collaged, stuck to the canvas. And the, the Stein poems particularly, I mean, I, I studied anti-modernism in preparation for the last book that I wrote, and, and the, everybody says, uses the phrase 12-year-old. Um, I'm, so, I'm not mocking you, David. You're, you're participating in a long tradition of doubt, which is to say anybody could do this. Um, I think Jackson McClough once said literally that to me when I went up to him after a reading and I said, Jackson, that was so beautiful. And he said, no, it's not. Anybody could do it. You just have to have a computer programmer and you have to have a source text. You could do it too. You don't, but you could. And I was abashed, but I, he was absolutely right. So maybe, maybe I don't know about a 12-year-old, but maybe others can do it. I think that democratizes art. But I think we should answer not so much the challenging question about how anybody could do it, but the question about what, how do we, what scale do we use, what, what measure do we use to say that it's good. So who wants to take a crack at that? I'm Maurice. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't think I approach poems thinking, how can I judge this against the tradition or um, against other poems in the historical context. Um, it's more 
if there's a richness that's possible there, if there's if it's a poem that excites my imagination, that provides some sort of outline that I can color with my own perceptions or memories or associations, then that's really all the criteria I need to make any sort of judgment. I, Good. Anna, a thought? Um, I totally agree with Amaris. I mean, I think that looking at poetry just like in the context of like the canon can be pretty misleading sometimes, especially when you have outliers like Stein who are doing things that are so different. And I think it's more helpful to think of Stein in the context of um, where she was and what she wanted to accomplish and how her poetry reflects that than how she fits in with you know, more tr the, the traditional trajectory. Right. So if she challenges narrative, she, she mocks or satirizes the American obsession with beginnings, middles, and ends, and therefore says, why is it that we always have to have stories that have a beautiful arc? What about lives that don't follow a beautiful arc? Uh, what about um, situations which don't have a middle? They, they only have a beginning and no end. And, and she sets herself out to do that, and then she writes in a way that subverts narrative. And, and on, on her own... If we, if we take seriously her own challenge to narrative, and I think we better, because it's a very reasonable thing to ask us, why is it that we impose narrative on everything? American history, American politics, our own lives. I mean, we all read memoirs in which beginning, middle, and end is obligatory. You read a biography, an autobiography of Jerry West, the basketball player, it starts with his birth. And then there's some kind of turning point in the middle. I mean, it all goes back to, you know, Pilgrim's Progress or Ma Flanders. You know, it's all about conversion to something that you, ha oh, my goodness, you became the thing you wanted to convert to, and then you end and die. Well, not an autobiography, typically you die. But, <laughs> um, but so this challenge is, and so what Anna's saying is that we, we, set, we set the standard based on what uh, Stein says she's going to do, and if we abide by that, if we think that's a reasonable standard and she meets it, then the poem has the richness that Amory suggests. And then, of course, it, you can't just do the same thing again and again and achieve the same goal. You have to vary it. And when you vary it, you start to change and condition and, you know, and all that stuff. Uh, last word on this, Kristen. Sure. I actually am going to disagree with you on the memoir thing because we're going to see a lot of people who are writing what could be considered oh, yeah, a poem memoir yeah, later sorry. that don't follow a narrative. And I know of a lot of memoirists, myself included, who don't follow a narrative. But um, what I was going to say is you have... I would also think you could ask this question about Emily Dickinson, whose p works were unpublished before she died. They, did, they weren't published until after her death. And you can say, like, how could you measure this up against the canon? Because what she was doing was totally different. And it probably wouldn't rate well if you were judging it based on the canon of that of, or the poems of that time. I think it was David so Blaine kind of and a, I. It's kind of a, like difficult question to answer at all because I think you can take any of the poets that we've studied here and say they wouldn't measure up to traditional say, canon. Say the same of almost the, the you know Wordsworth was writing in the in the mud. Like why why is he writing about peasants in this rhyming this is ridiculous. This is childlike. Not to mention William Blake. Not to mention John Milton Paradise Lost. Huh? Seriously? That's what your project is? Not to mention Stravinsky. Not to mention Picasso, not to mention Beethoven's Ninth. I think it was David Blaine and I, it might have been somebody else, who had a back and forth in the discussion forums about the Ninth. I mean, people couldn't stand it. They couldn't hear it. They put, and he was famous by that point. And they put their ears, their hands over their ears. And now we think of the Ninth as the most melodious thing that's ever been done. So I think that we have to just sort of relax a little about what the canon is. And when we get to Chapter 9, we're going to be looking at works that aren't in the canon yet or just emerging into the canon, and the canon is shifting. We've done a lot in the last 30 years thinking about how the canon isn't all that it's cracked up to be. And uh, Shakespeare's uh, scholarship has done a lot to understand the, this sort of aspire, aspirational middle-class guy who so, you know, had undoubted native talent in putting words together, but kind of really thought through in strategic ways, economic ways, theatrical ways. What it, and, you know, it's almost an accident that it comes to the end, and we think that Shakespeare is totally can, can, canonical and the guy against which all standards should be set. So yes. I want, what I want to do, Amaris wants to say anything, but I'm going <laughs> not, to not, not let her do it because I want to move on. Um, we're going to take a call. And then I'd like to ask a question of some of the folks who visited us today. Lily, who's on? Well, continuing with Stein, we have Beth calling from Chicago who has a question about Let Us Describe. Great. Hello, Beth. Oh, hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, you're okay, great. great. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? 
Good. How's Chicago today? Chicago is a little dreary. It's okay. It's probably going to get a little sunny, but right now it's a little gray. Wait a minute. Chicago? Dreary? <laughs> I've never heard of that before. Yeah, well, <laughs> actually, um, I love Chicago, so. So do I. I, I. I spend as much time at the Regenstein Library at the University of Chicago as I can. Hyde oh. Park is cool. Yeah, Hyde Park is cool. I love Philadelphia, I must say. Come uh, visit us. Did I you... will. I'm planning on it sometime soon, I hope. Did, oh, Lily is very excited. <laughs> she she wants you to visit. Um, Did you watch the video tour of the Writer's House? Of course, yes, I did. I actually posted about it, but um, it was such a great surprise, as I posted on Facebook, I think, that to log in and, and have that wonderful tour. It was great. Very warm, wonderful. You're all great. I feel like I know you. Hello, hello. You do know us. <laughs> well, I don't know why Modpo people think they feel they know us. You do know us. I mean, yeah, we, are, we are simply what you see and hear all, after all this time. Well, this is true. But you know that whole kind of virtual thing that yeah. is uh, yeah. it's an interesting phenomenon, but it's great and wonderful. And Isn't I it time to get over that virtual thing? <laughs> I mean, I think that in 2012, with the technology we have and the globalism that we think is important culturally and conversationally, don't you think we should get over the virtual thing and consider us knowing each other? Sure. So yeah, I mean, that's me. a leading question, but it is. I, no, I just... But I, yeah. yeah. I feel that way. It is. It's interesting. It's, it's, it's yeah. great. It really is uh, It's fulfilling. But when you walk into the door of this house, you will feel, I believe it's an artificial feeling, but, you know, we are bodies in space, after all, let's give us credit for that. You'll walk oh. in, and you'll, and you'll be here, and you'll touch the walls, and you'll shake my hand, and then you'll feel like the journey was complete. But I'm suggesting that the journey is pretty far along the way toward that already, whether you visit or not. Well, I agree, and that's very well said. So thank, thank you. you. I thought it was well said, too. I had no idea where that was going to go. Speaking of the yeah, Pilgrim's Yeah, it was progress. good. It was good. Okay. <laughs> So, um, well, do you I'm, have a question? I'm sure I you call. Do. Yeah. I, well, I have a question about. Uh, well, this is a Gertrude Stein. Let us describe. Beautiful. Uh, and I have found her. I, of course, first I was. It was very daunting, and I thought, oh my, you know, I will never get this. But she's really interesting. I've done a lot of research, and I really, I've liked a lot of her stuff, and and um, if you will, stuff. And. Uh, the repetitive works great. I've done a, some research, and I just want to add this in. Uh, is you probably know, obviously, Alice B. Toklas was her lover, girlfriend, friend yes. for many years. Yes. It makes me wonder if they did eat any of those brownies during all of this process, but we don't have to go there. Oh, well, what, what did you think was in the brownies? I thought she just... <laughs> yeah, never mind. <laughs> never mind. I mean, this is, the FCC is not listening to this, but right. you and I, could we could go to jail if we start talking about well, our we're experiences We're not going to talk about that, brownies. but let's talk about... Well, will you bring describe. some brownies when you come to Philly? <laughs> Regular ones. Regular, Regular brownies. brownies. The Kristen's at the door checking the brownies. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, anyway, she's an interesting woman, no doubt. Very bold, very bright. But let us describe, I have a question about, or just wanted to talk about, and that is, uh, and I probably picked this one because it is probably the most coherent, that at the beginning anyway. Um, yes. But when she says, let us describe how they went, I questioned whether that means how they took their journey on this road this night or how they died. Yes, both. When, okay, right, both. And uh, just at the end, you know, uh, when she says many others did go and there was a sacrifice of what shall we, a sheep, a hen, etc. To me, the what shall we just kind of seems like she minimizes what was sacrificed in a way. Mm. Um, but, and then, um, and all that, and then having been blessed, let us bless it. And to me, it kind of just seems like that uh, those who survived, you know, were sanctified or whatever, and, and um, I, maybe I'm being too simplistic here, but that's the, the last sentence is the one that kind of trips me up a little bit and just wanted to hear you guys, your input. Thank you, Beth, for the question. It's a fantastic question. Um, does anybody want to, Anna, we were just yeah. talking about this yesterday. Do you want to yeah. say a word or two about this? Well, I think your exactly, your intuition's exactly right, you know, how it starts off very coherently, and then it starting with the, you know, many others did go. The whole thing just kind of falls apart. Yeah. But that's very intentional, and it's very wrought the way that it falls apart. And what we're supposed to kind of get from that is that what happened to these people is they had an accident, and right. you can't talk about an accident in these like concrete terms. The way you talk about an accident is by the whole kind of poem just sort of like imploding. You know, it's and there's a sacrifice of what shall we? How do you finish that sentence? It was an accident. 
a sheep, a hen, a cock, a village, I get sort of a an image of like the car just like spinning around and like all of these things, you know, just kind of flashing by like the windows of the car. So it's actually quite descriptive. Right. Yeah, and it's I just It's descriptive of an accident and the writing is accidental in its quality. Max, um I I'm going to guess that you were fairly moved by the various discussions we've had over the last few months by this description of an accident. Do you want to add something? Yeah, I think uh, t to add to what Anna was saying, it's uh, this last sentence is sort of a, I mean, I don't want to overread it, although we can't really do that, but this last sentence is sort of a, a swerving and then there's a blur and it's kind of a crash. All this is sort of happening on the, on the level of, of the language, of the grammar, of the form. Um, it, this, this sudden blur, as Anna was saying, the spinning car, you see a sheep, a hen, a cock, a village. Um, and then next thing you know, you're sort of at the eulogy. It's, it's this, this crashing, this compressing yeah. Of, yeah. of the language that's yeah. sort of describing this, this accident, what happens in an accident. Beth, yes, have you, you don't have to tell us anything personal, but have you known someone who was killed in an accident? Well, uh, actually, no. Not, I have not known anyone well, who was killed. Well, I have, and my, when I first read this poem, I thought, this is the first time I've ever read anything about someone dying in an accident, mm -hmm. or an accident, which reproduced the accidental quality of, so that the description really refuses to describe in whole ways, because you know, the best way to memorialize someone who died in an accident is to write accidentally. Or to put it another way, um, this death, these deaths didn't make sense. Yeah. And so how could you possibly make conventional sense when you're writing about a death that didn't make sense? So I think, you know, I don't think that Gertrude Stein is polemical too often. I mean, she, she thinks she's a genius, so her language <laughs> outside the poetry often sounds like she knows and you don't. But, right. but I don't think she's being polemical, but implicit here is this following polemic. Sometimes we have to stop making sense. Sometimes the world doesn't make sense. Sometimes things that happen to people we love doesn't make sense. And so I, she says, am going to write a prose piece which begins by making sense and then delivers these people to a, to a situation and a place that doesn't make sense. And then lacking the ability now in the 20th century, with all due respect to those who believe in heaven uh, or the, our God's plan, um, lacking that in her modernist thinking. She can't find herself able to say that it was all intended, that it was all God's will. And so she provides an alternative blessing, which is the blessing of writing, of literature, that provides a solace by saying, I understand. I understand how things don't make sense, and I'm not going to write in a common sense way about something that doesn't make sense. I'm going to try to reproduce the situation, the feeling of not making sense. And for us, for you, Beth, um, you know, you start reading something like this, you reach the end of this thing and you say, I don't understand it, and then you grapple with it, and then you begin. It's like visiting someone in the hospital or, or the bereaved loved one of someone who's gone, and you, what, what do you say to them? How shall we? How shall we? Let us describe. And you say to them, I don't, I don't understand. This doesn't make sense. You say to that person. And then I think they look at you in the face and they think, well, finally someone who doesn't have a coherent hallmark card way of, of telling me about how it all makes sense. It doesn't make sense. So I, I, I know I'm overreading this. Oh. That is to say I'm investing too much emotion in it. But I think it speaks to me in this way. So... Um, Thank you, Beth. For well, thank you. And actually, that did make sense. <laughs> yeah, Great. and that's why I'm so happy. That's why I'm so happy that um, that people in in the discussion forums in Modpo have gotten to week four, and they're looking at stuff that doesn't make sense, and they're saying, "No, it does make sense. It makes perfect sense. We're going to try this." You know, there, there are plenty of doubters, but the doubters have been really nice this week. <laughs> now, probably my having said that will just unleash the doubters, but. <laughs> You know, I think we're all trying to take this seriously. This is a challenge to the way language usually works to provide us the utility of getting through our days. Yeah. Sometimes um, the days suck. <laughs> and this is a way of finding an alternative way of understanding the accidental quality of our lives. Right. Sorry, I'm sermonizing. 
I think yeah. that Jason has something to add. Well, I think I want to turn to Jason on the next topics because okay. we're going to run out of time. Okay, but thank you so thank much. Thank you, Beth, and, so uh, much thank for you. calling. All right. Yeah. Bye-bye. Jason, on a different topic, I want to invite you to bring up a topic and then maybe we'll, we'll talk to some of our friends about how they're doing. Do you have something in mind? Because I have if you don't. I, th- I switcherooed you. Sorry, you wanted. Right. Well, actually, I'll just. This is a one sentence. You're going to say it anyway. I'm going to okay. say it anyway. You're a teacher, but that, man. That, You're a teacher. That uh, to think of Stein and what she's doing with language as a deep play. If we think of her being in France, that in French to uh, bless, bless is a, a verb that means to wound or injure. So, which is seriously. A, yeah, yeah blessure yeah. is is um, an, an so injury. She's playing on that f- pun because obviously this is a French situation, isn't it? Those French roads. Well, and it's also a kind of uh, accident of language of two wor- two words meaning uh, such divergent things, the same sound coming yeah. out. Yeah. Jesus. I'm really glad that you commandeered that comment. Okay. <laughs> You're really good, Jason. Um, why don't you um, uh, put the mic over by Christine, or give the mic to Christine. Sorry, Christine, I'm putting you on the spot, but um, <laughs> can you tell us what... Put Mike right up to you, please. Yeah. Hi, Christine. Hi. <laughs> I'm so glad you came I'm to the so Writer's glad to be House. Here. What, is the grateful. Writer's House look like you expected it? Yes. It does, it's, doesn't it's it? It's beautiful, and I loved your tour of it yesterday, too, so I was prepared. <laughs> you didn't even need to walk through the tour. You had the virtual tour. Um, <laughs> So what's, what's Stein been like for you? First of all, I should ask, are you caught up? Um, almost. Okay, yeah. good. Well, I have no experience with poetry in general, or Gertrude Stein in particular. Um, it's been wonderful. I would say a lot of times I take a different interpretation than what um, the consensus is. So, yeah. and again, you because feel I have that no that gets heard or responded to? I have a hard time, again, with the discussion boards. There's so many, and I don't have enough time to try to comb through and see if anybody's come up with the same thought. I will tell you my thoughts on um, Let Us Describe. Okay. Okay. And by the way, with blessed, I believe it's an, an old uh, Southern colloquialism to say someone blessed me out, which means they yelled at me. So I don't know if that's oh, part of the really? French. Can yeah. we use that idiom I believe. in English? I'm going to use it today, if possible. I'm going to find a way to bless Anna out, because she's always annoying me for one reason sure. or another. But anyway... Um, How are you doing, Anna? <laughs> <laughs> with the um, with this with let us describe I I found a different kind of interpretation um, prudent not to venture I felt um, that they some people were using their physical fear uh, made them lose their chance to maybe venture out intellectually um, so Christine, those who had planned to go, right up to you, okay please. those who had planned to go were unable to do so because then she says many others did go and there was a sacrifice and I feel that the people at the party that were, that were able to go maybe of their notions, ideas, because I do feel Gertrude Stein kind of blows everything up so far, and then now we're left with the pieces and as people are trying to make sense of it. And then when she goes on to say, um, a, a sheep, a hen, a cock, a village, a ruin, I was trying to think what each of one of those words meant. Like, to me, a sheep would be a follower, a hen, domesticity, a cock, sex, a village, the aggregate, a ruin, what was left after the party. Wow. Nice. You got this <laughs> and then, out. Really well, <laughs> And then having been blessed, and, and, and in Gertrude Stein's world, perhaps, they were blessed by losing their intellectual notions and ideas. Um, let us bless it. Let's, let us lose our wow. of this nature. That's a That's, meta poetic yeah. reading. I don't know. That's what do you awesome. mean you don't know? Really <laughs> that good. was really did great. You write, did you write that up fully? Because I saw, I th- saw, I thought I saw something you posted. But see, it's one of those based things. on the word venture. Is that right? Um, well, when they, they were, yeah, prudent not to venture. I thought that's very sensible, and yeah. I don't know that Gertrude is fond of people who are so prudent not to venture. Well, but two, I, don't. I have two things to say, and then I want to move on to Julia, uh, who no doubt has a whole pileup of, speaking of accidents, a whole pileup of people who want to ask questions. Um, I guess I want to say first that you, if I could have Wizard of Oddish, a bag that had a, a degree in it, or a master's or something, I'd give you an honorary master's of literary interpretation. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, no, I think you're great, and I think you should quit whatever you do to make your money and, and you know, join the thousands of us who are in the uh, unpaid or not paid well uh, ranks of the humanists of this world. Um, but um, second, I would say, please, um, find five minutes at the end of your long day and just go to the discussion forums and search 
Okay. For the words that you used in your previous post, or I know threading through or going through the threads, you're going to lose the one that didn't get responded to, but we're going to fix that next time we offer the course and have a more robust search function there. But I would urge you to bring some of that brilliance that you just showed here. Maybe that's why you came. You figure you would do your due diligence and go back to obscurity. But <laughs> It's forcing me to take the time to really think and not just have feelings, and but not... Yeah. Uh, focus on my well, thoughts. Well, I want to look at that word forcing you, and, and, and I don't mind it. Uh, I, I, it's not a tonal thing. It's not like we're not for It's a free course for no credit, so right. no one's being forced to do anything. But I think forcing us is what the poets do and what these fabulous TAs do, which is to say, how can you look at these people and these poets who've invested so much and so much passion in trying to understand this stuff and walk away from it even though your life is busy? And I think that's exactly. one of the reasons why the participation rate has kept up. So... Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Um, Julia Block, how are you? I'm great. Um, I have one quick thing to add from Twitter from yes. a user called Laughing Mouse um, who says, Jason, there is one like that in German too. The word gift in German also means poison. So, um, And it turns out somebody else had also posted about the French word laissez on the discussion forums meaning to injure. So um, lots of threads picking up there. I do have another question from the discussion forum from Barbara, which is, I think, a really important question about if I told him a completed portrait of Ah, if I told him, would he like it? Would he like it if I told him? Yes. And Barbara asks, who is the I speaking in the portrait of Picasso? Who is the I? Who okay. is speaking? Julia, I want to, I want, we'll answer this question of Barbara's uh, eff effectively and efficiently, I think. Um, and then I want to come back to you briefly, and w in the meantime, will you kind of summarize some of the questions and give a, characterize the questions in the forum and also in the t Twitter feed? Because I feel like during these sessions, it goes so fast that yeah. a lot of interesting people don't get represented, and I know that's where most people are. So I don't know how you'll do that, but maybe you can kind of summarize or give an overview of what's, th what's the traffic like. Sure. Um, thank you. Meantime... Um, who is the I? Um, Amaris and Dave, it's, you haven't been able to speak in a while. If you get right up to the mic, I'd love to hear what you say. Um, I actually think it's a pun on the, between the I that speaks and the I that sees, because it is entitled a portrait, and I'm sure people were confused by that. What she's doing is imitating linguistically what Picasso was doing with paint. Um, and so I think the eye is actually the eye that shifts um, with every perspective and in light and... Um, any, anything like and do that. we have visual prove it do we have visuality in the poem do we do we do we have anything that suggests that she's thinking e y e as well well I mean everything is um, visual intellectual emotional right? when she that comes was an down answer to, to my question uh, when she Al, comes down to I judge is, judge she's I judge, judging judge. the authority of the I that's nice yeah Dave Good. Any specific yeah. evidence Dave well I can't who's really the I get close to the mic I can't really add much to what Amarie said because I agree with it totally. I think it is uh, a lot about perspective. It's a shifting perspective, especially in the second page. I land two. I land three. The land three. Three. The land two. I land two. I land. It's all perspectives at once. So she's playing with it. She's playing with the cubist interpretation. Um, yeah. Let, let's let's hear. Let's just hear a few seconds of the performance just so we can remember the flow of it and you know we don't have a lot of recordings of Stein unfortunately but Penn Sound has some and I think if we had more recordings of Stein I think Stein would be more in the mainstream because the she really is doing something that's akin to painting and dance and without the vocal part of it you you aren't necessarily reminded you keep looking at the semantics of it so here she is Steve are you ready? If I told him if I told him, would he like it? Would he like it if I told him? Now, not now, and now. Now, exactly as as kings. Feeling full for it. Exactitude as kings. So to beseech you as full as for it. Exactly or as kings. Shutters shut and open, so do queens. Shutters shut and shutters, and so shutters shut, and shutters, and so, and so shutters, and so shutters shut, and so shutters shut, and shutters, and so. And so shutters shut, and so and also. What's all the shutters shut? Um, um, Jason, would you 
um, give the mic to anyone who looks like she might want to speak, and they may not. They may all look like they won't want to. Speak. Andrea, hello, Andrea. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Thanks for coming today. Oh, thank what you. What is this stuff about shutters shut and shut and shutters shut and? Well, when you're talking about the eye, I immediately went to shutters. So that was as in as in opening and shutting. Blinking of eyes. Good. Keep going, Andrea. I think there's and some more. And also, I, I see, you know, the other thing with shutters is windows. So opening windows. the window in and out. Good. Windows Being able to see to in and out. House of Possibility stuff. And there's mm -hmm. a third one, I think. Camera. Camera. You did it. <laughs> it's like, this is like, wait, wait, don't tell me. You did it. And what... <laughs> And Max, what prize does she win for having gotten all three? You get I guess you voicemail. Right you get Max doing your voicemail. I'll do your voicemail. By the way, <laughs> if you want that, would you like it? Hi. I totally do. Andrea's not home. My name is Max. If you want to talk to me, leave a message. What do you think, Max? Is that cool? I, I, no, I think you offer that as a, uh, as a, I think my voice would be better than Gosling's, honestly. <laughs> Andrea, that was great. So let's go through all three. So first was the eye, the shutter shut. So... Well, how would that work in the Stein poem, in this thing, this port, this alternative portrait? I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but... Um, I guess in terms of shutters shutting and opening, it's you're seeing and not seeing. It's kind of the different perspectives that you're nice. seeing. Nice. That's really good. Okay. Boy, you're, we've got to hand out another master's degree. These master's degrees are just flying out of the bag. Um, <laughs> uh, the second one was the house. This is a little harder. I I just saw that as being you know opening the the world shutting the possibility the the idea letting of in, the letting, out, letting in not letting yeah. in not letting out etc right and then there's this stuff about kings and queens so one thinks almost of the open or closed um, uh, do, dominion domain yeah yeah um, and and Picasso is thought of as the king of the modern art scene and she's kind of the queen really they are the king and queen what a pair they make. And um, she's fooling around with his reputation in this poem, no doubt, as Ula Dido has taught us. And then the third one was the camera. This is cool. I see a couple of things with that. One would be the sort of snapshots that occur when you take things from different perspectives, the kind of um, just different shots. But then also you can play with... Um, by opening or closing the shutter on a camera, you can play with how it's perceived. You can play with yeah. what the image. Okay, so projects. I'm going to riff slightly for the next minute on um, meta poetry here, and then we're going to go back to Julia for a summary of stuff going on in the Twitter feed and the uh, uh, discussion forums, and then we'll go to Lily for another call if she has one, but she doesn't. Two one five five seven three nine seven five two. So in a way. What Gertrude Stein in that poem is doing is she's looking at a Picasso painting, not at Picasso's person, but at a painting, and she's doing a poem based on the kind of things that get done in the painting. So that is a meta-meta poem. She's writing a poem about another person's way of doing the same thing that she's doing in the painting. Sorry, we started with the hardest thing, the meta-meta poem. Right? Everybody's with me on that, right? That's not that hard. Instead of writing about the world, in a way that Picasso sees the world, she writes about the way Picasso paints the world. And he paints the world in a way that she's using in her poem to be a poem about a painting about the world in the style that the painting is about the world. That's a meta poem, meta meta poem. Now, what's just as interesting is that Stein is also saying, no, I'm not writing a poem that's derivative of Picasso's way of doing the world. I'm writing a way of doing the world that is derivative of Picasso's style. I'm going to do the world. So instead of saying, um, here is how the shutter shut and shutter shut in the three ways you mentioned renders this cup, and I am going to write about how Picasso renders that cup visually, I am going to try my own theory about how the cup cupness comes into language in a way that shows that I can do the same thing as Picasso, maybe even better. Right? So in a sense what she's saying, and I said this in the video discussion, but it's worth repeating because it's a complicated point, is that there is a word-world relationship between <clears throat> mug, that thing, that sign, mug, and the signified, uh, the pre-linguistic mug. Okay? Um, so there is, a, there is a pointing, and she really believes in that referentiality. However, she's also interested in a relationship between and among the signs. She's interested in the relationship between a word mug and another word mug, or the way in which mug has been languaged and another word she could use for it. 
So she's creating not just word things re thing relationships, but word word relationships, and that's the breakthrough that Picasso did in painting. Huh. That's so. What I just said could be a whole semester, you know, of a seminar. But I, I think that's what she's doing, and it's I'm happy to be able to summarize it. Julia Block, are you able to summarize what's happening in the Twitter sphere and forum sphere? I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try. Bless you for trying because it's really hard. You're great. All right. So I think what I so I just quickly did a survey of the Twitter feed and then the discussion forum, and I I think there are there are three different strands going on. So number one, I see a lot of students, a lot of a lot of participants who are thinking really hard about the sequence of our course. So some people are still talking about Dickinson and Whitman and could either of them be ever considered an imagist, especially in the case of Dickinson, and um, what is the relationship between them and the, and the modernist edges that we're studying now. Um, there's another kind of theme going on about Stein, about a lot of people are citing their breakthroughs with Stein. Um, uh, Therese on Twitter says, I had a big breakthrough last night with Stein, thanks to Dave Poplar and his reference to primal chance and repetition. And it seems like for a lot of people, this connection between Stein and performance and chanting has made something click, has, has kind of like put them over the edge into, okay, I, I get, I'm getting something really rich out of Stein. Right. Um, and then there's a third strand, and I, this comes from Karen on Twitter and Sandra in the discussion forums, and they're both um, suggesting, well, Sandra's question, which I think is a really good one, is why does poetry need to move you? Um, it, some, some poetry is effective because it's intellectually sharp. Um, you know, isn't, isn't that, I think, what she's suggesting is, isn't that an important part of what we're doing here? Isn't that funny? We, it's something that, the, that Senator Dick Durbin said. Yeah. Uh, he, he said, like, I'm a senator, so people expect me to be totally senatorial all the time. And when I go to church, people say, oh, he can be spiritual, too. And then he said, and then when people see me at the gym, they say, oh, yeah, well, it's good that he works out because he's a body, not just a policy wonk. Right. As if there's a distinction there. And, <laughs> and then when he, when he does his poetry course, people say, oh, Dick, he has a soft and sentimental side. Well, I think Dick Durbin is suggesting that we ought to integrate these selves. Yeah. And the poetry is not simply the place you go when you want to be sentimental and sweet and miss someone. But in fact, it's, um, it's like everything else. So that's cool. Um, you wanted to say another thing, I know. Um, yeah, just that Karen um, on Twitter, who is someone who, I, you know, I checked out her website, and she's she's a, a writer um, who's very very interested in Stein, and she says, let's let's talk about the poem itself. Let's talk about the Anglo-Saxon words, the list, the metaphysics, the repetition, the negativity, the rare allusions. Let's talk about the texture of the language. So, in a in a weird way, you know, we talk a lot about meta poetry in our course, and I think the discussions that we see on Twitter and the discussion forums are also themselves kind of meta discussions, which which I like. I like that that we're all kind of obsessed with, okay, what are we doing here? <laughs> what are we actually talking about when we're talking about these poems? Yeah. Hey, Julia, you did a great job in that summary. And for the, for the rest of the webcasts, let's make sure we always take time for you to, I know it's hard to do on the fly, but let's make sure that you always take time to summarize the activity there. Because if I were, you know, if I were watching this, and wanting to feel involved, I would post something and hope that it registered somehow. So I appreciate that. Um, we're going to take one more call from, uh, from the phone, and then we'll wing it. We've got about 10 minutes left. So, Lily. Al, I have Ingrid from Toronto on the phone. Ingrid Phillip. Um, and she, I think, as we're moving towards wrapping up, has just an interesting comment about reading Stein within our course. OK. Well, let's put Ingrid on. Ingrid, how are you? I'm fine, Al. How are you doing? It's been a long time. You visited us once about 10 years ago, maybe? Well, I'm retired now, so I hope to get back there real soon. Um, Ingrid, you're either right next to your phone, so that there's this distortion. I want you to try just to put the phone away, an inch away, and try it again. OK. I'm also going to move upstairs away from the feed. No, that's not working. Go back to, go back to the way you were, and we'll let Steve McLaughlin figure out what's wrong with this. OK. It's okay. those phone lines from Canada. <laughs> oh, I know, I know what it is, Ingrid. They've tapped your phone. Oh, of course. Because you are like a serious radical. I know I am. I am. Thanks, Al, for the compliment. And a pe <laughs> No, it's a compliment. You're a pen alum, and you stirred up a lot of trouble in the 60s. I sure did. <laughs> yeah. So stir up some trouble now. Go ahead. It's not 
trouble actually. It's it's like a, a aha moment that I'm I'm very thrilled with um, regarding what we're doing here. And as a retired teacher, I just wanted to share it with you. It's this idea that you're talking about eyes and cameras. Uh, what I want you to do, Ingrid, is speak the same thing you're going to speak, but separate your words a little so that it'll be easier to hear for everybody. There's a lot of slurring and blurring. Okay. Okay. The, the point I'm making is that uh, we have 30,000 pairs of eyes on these poems, and it's like we had the opportunity in this course to do something that the painters could never do. We have all of these different approaches to the poem using all of our eyes and the chance to combine what we see through this course. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. No, that really is beautiful. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm going to invite Kristen to say a word in response or maybe just to sure summarize what she thinks that Ingrid just said, nice and close to the mic. Yeah, I, I totally would have to agree with what Ingrid is saying, and I think it's a great observation to make that, you know, when you have all of the eyes um, of everyone who's taking the course on these poems, we're all seeing things from different perspectives, and so we're kind of mimicking what the, paint, the Cubist painters were doing and what Gertrude Stein was trying to do, and she was giving us, you know, the dis description of objects in Tender Buttons or in Let Us Describe or a completed portrait of Pablo Picasso, you know. She's trying to show us the process on the page, and I think we're, we're, we're all coming through to that process as well in the discussion forums and in conversations like this and the videos that we recorded a couple months ago, and it, I, I think it's great. So Jason, um, I saw you nodding when Ingrid was talking. Do you want to say very briefly what you're thinking? Sure. I, I think that that Ingrid's point is right on, and the fact that we can have thousands of eyes on a poem at once is something that has happened in, it's it's kind of like suddenly everyone in a, a thousand libraries suddenly can become aware of the thousand other people sitting there uh, looking and a, a kind of beautiful uh, multiplicity arises that is yeah. gorgeous. And poetry to watch. is one of those topics, subject matters, where that's completely appropriate, and it may not be appropriate in every topic that's covered by a Coursera course. Ingrid, tomorrow I'm meeting with Daphne Kohler, who's one of the two founders of Coursera. She's very interested in what we're doing. We're trying a few experiments. First of all, we're covering an art rather than a science. And second, we're doing, there's more interactivity here, and um, discussion forums are really a key place. So I think I'm going to try to summarize what you said, if you don't mind, if I have your permission okay. to okay. do so. And I think one of the things that I'll say um, about what you said is that Poetry is probably the ideal subject matter for 30,000 eyes, pairs of eyes on it. Um, the effect it produces has already been said by you and Kristen and Jason, so I won't repeat it. But the power of it on the other side is phenomenal. I never got, I was expecting lots of pushback from contemporary poets, those who are in the course and those who are not in the course. Um, I was expect, these are pretty, like, pretty avant-garde people. They're not elitists. They're actually, they have a very strong democratic streak. But, you know, they, they're, they're, they jealously guard their ability to publish. They like to be sort of around when people talk about their poems, if possible. And, you know, these are all natural things. I never got any pushback from any of them. Oh, you're going to dumb down poetry. This is, you know, poetry for the people. It's not going to work. No, and the reason is because it thrilled them, every one of them, it thrilled them to think that all these people would be reading them. They were ready to liberate their poems, to let their poems go out there and be understood, well understood, not well understood, and bantered about. So, and that's your spirit, that democratic spirit, Ingrid. <laughs> Thank you. So, did I hear the word retired when you said something before? Retired from teaching. Retired from teaching. I know you're very active, doing lots of things. I hope, thanks for calling. I hope you're going to get very, very involved in the last five weeks. 
of Modpo and that you'll someday come and visit us again. Well, thank you, Al. Thanks. Talk to you soon. Um, I'm going to wrap up, and this was only an hour and five minutes, and uh, I apologize uh, for those of you who there's some more, plenty more questions, but next time we'll do a longer session. I wanted to say two things in conclusion. First of all, I just wanted to point out one of the most fabulous threads in the discussion forum. Um, it was started by Tracy Sonnefeld, who is a teacher, I believe. Um, I've been reading Tracy's contributions a lot. I think she's a teacher, and I think she's also a writer. Um, and this contribution is called The Language of Color. The Language of Color. I hope everybody will search in the search box of the discussion forum main page and find it. Um, she wrote a beautiful, wonderful, I, I almost want to say authoritative contribution to the discussion of a long dress. Uh, and she writes that it seems to her that a long dress is in part about using language in both conventional and unconventional ways to question and subvert our assumptions about that language. And a little later in her first contribution to this thread, which has gotten many responses, she wrote, Surpri Stein's surprising color, color mashup here moves perhaps closer to the reality of our subjective experience of color than does traditional representational language. I just think that's a fantastic thing to say. First of all, it, it, it does what I love, which is it puts poetry right up there, and maybe even above the, its sister arts, makes claims for it about color. Um, it's also, Tracy's contribution is just as sophisticated as anybody, in a way that anybody has written about the language of color. After all, language isn't colorful, visually. Right, so the language of color, I mean, my colleague Wendy Steiner has written a whole book about the language of color years ago. Um, Tracy's comment is right up there in sophistication, theoretical and other sophistication. And I just wanted to praise Tracy, but also praise Modpo people for teaching me about the language of color. That's a really tough topic. And only embracing Stein would get you there. And I also want to praise Modpo people for realizing that this very difficult and challenging and theoretically sophisticated contribution in the discussion forum when we're all really busy received 17 upvotes her contribution all the other replies received upvotes but 17 people said I get this I like it I understand it and I think sometimes our when we like on Facebook we're just sort of passing by someone instead of just taking time to write a comment we just click like whether we like it or not we're just sort of registering our presence. I believe these 17 likes are, I mean, it's really hard to read a thing like this and just press, press upvote and not have contemplated it. So congratulations to Tracy and to us for creating some kind of venue where this is possible. And I want to end by referring to um, Sarah Diaz. Um, so what I'm going to say about Sarah, she's put it right out there. She's come out and, the, and she's made it really clear who she is and what she is and what struggles she has. And just, I'm just foregrounding Sarah as a brave, intrepid Modpo person and also celebrating the fact as it's beginning to dawn on me four weeks in that we're doing something that's actually really revolutionary uh, here. Making, making uh, this kind of intentional and I think it's safe to say high quality offering of a course, a real legitimate course with all of its bugs like all those essays, how do we really deal with them? These kinds of big questions that we're going to have to answer in the next few years. Nonetheless, Sarah is someone who could never possibly participate otherwise. Sarah uh, describes herself as 53 years old, poor levels of energy and mobility. She suffers from fibromyalgia and uh, concurrent with that PTSD, which obviously has something to do with that, and depression. And she, because of the medication she needs to take for the fibromyalgia, myalgia, she feels fuzzy and unable to focus, which she wouldn't otherwise were she not taking the medication to help her with that other condition. And so she has to study at her own pace. But she can, she discovered, study at her own pace with us. Well, actually she can't because she's got to keep up week by week, but within any given week she can. She is in Cape Town, South Africa. She would have very limited access to us here unless she paid a whole lot of money for the airfare, the dorm room, uh, the, adult ed the adult learner status, which is a very special status at a university like this. And she would get less access to me probably here on campus than she would, than she does in Modpo, which that's to be believed, but I think that's true. She writes, the opportunity to learn more about poetics in this rich environment is exactly what I needed to increase my knowledge and improve my own writing skills. 
She began this course absolutely terrified, she said, of everything and everyone, and the first two weeks was overwhelming. But four weeks into the course, although exhausted, I am actually having fun. And if you knew me and the state of this dysthemia I'm constantly in, you would understand how unusual that is. So she writes that she applauds the infectious energy of me and the TAs, and what I would say simply to Sarah is the applause is going in the wrong direction. Yeah, it's probably easier for you to sit there in Cape Town and applaud us. But we're doing stuff that we normally do around here. What you're doing is stuff that you don't normally do. So we applaud you. I mean, we applaud you, Sarah, and everybody else who's far flung and for other reasons unable otherwise to learn. Poetry, after all, the thing that you're supposed to do, be able to do in life without. I think a lot of people are realizing that we can't do without it and that it takes a community this large or almost this large to get our heads all the way around it. So, Sarah, I, I'm going to applaud you. I'm literally going to applaud you. I know you're watching today. I want to applaud you because I want you to feel like there's cheerleaders here, here in Philadelphia, USA, who want you to go all the way through the course. So, Sarah? <laughs> and Mr. Talionis and everybody else, who, by the way, I heard from last night, who's sent another essay. I don't know why he can't post to the discussion forums, but you know what? I don't give a fuck <laughs> that he can't post the forum. If he sends me a message, the other day I signed off, thank you my friend, comma my friend, period. And I just thought it was like a Greek thing to do or something, <laughs> I don't know. And he wrote back and he said he was very moved by my, the last two words of my message, my friend. I just thought, I've got a friend. I'm going to Athens to find Mr. Talionis. Anyway, um, so um, listen, I wanted to thank Julia. Julia Block, how are you? I'm great. Um, and just so you know, Sarah's also with us on Twitter. She says, got a lot out of the, pot, out of the webcast, thank you. Oh, Loud wow. applause. Oh, that's amazing. Gosh. Um, Julia, you're terrific. I'm really sorry you're not in Philly, but I know East, East Hollywood is a cool place, and we're just going to decamp and go there at some point. Yeah, do it. Okay. And you and I owe everybody an up, a weekly update. We didn't do that one this week, partly because we had our video tour, but I hope you and I will do an update soon. Yeah, let's do that. Do you want to say any? If, I mean, my intro for next week is already posted. My audio interest intro for week five is already posted, and um, so everybody should listen to it. But I guess I just want to cheerlead for next week. We're now going to spend one week looking at resistance to modernism, doubts about modernism, downright anti-modernism. We're going to do it through uh, a small selection of Harlem Renaissance poets who loved modernism but actually felt that it was urgent to do it another way. Uh, with with traditional f uh, for, uh, stanza forms. We're going to do it through the communist poets, and we're going to do it through Robert Frost, and then we're going to do it by skipping to the 1950s through the so-called neo-formalist or conservative poets. So we're only going to have one week on doubts about modernism, because this is a, a course that's going to headlong past that to the Beats, and then to the New York poets, and then to the Chapter 9 poets who are contemporary. But next week is a chance for us to really think about doubts, to think about that. And there's some pretty interesting poets in there. So I hope you'll take a long, long look at those poems and, and listen to my 18-minute audio introduction, which does the sort of difficult thing of summarizing it. Um, we also um, uh, are going to be looking at a Harlem Renaissance poet, who's not really Harlem Renaissance, who comes later, Gwendolyn Brooks. And uh, the gang and I have recorded an audio discussion of one of the Gwendolyn Brooks poems, so we hope you enjoy that. So I want to thank Anna and Kristen and Amaris, who speak so loudly. <laughs> I, did I try? I tried slightly. How loud is she? Be loud. <laughs> I'm Maurice. This, this is me being extremely projecting. There you go. That's great. <laughs> you have a great voice. Just you know, it's it's not ready for prime time. And uh, <laughs> Dave, Dave Poplar is always and Maxime, you're the best. Thank you. Alex. Yes. And Lily Applebaum on the phone and Steve McLaughlin who does an amazing job on the audio. Chris Martin who is a total hero. Jason, who's sort of an audience guy, uh, Christine, Valerie, Andrea, Colette, and of course Julia Block. We're signing off from the moon. I don't know, where are we? <laughs> Philadelphia, we love you all, and we're going to look at the discussion forums about this podcast, about this webcast, and see what you have to say. Bye bye, have a great day. <laughs>